breakfast puppies? This podcast contains adult language and content and is meant for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Kevin Sambita of Palladium Books, and you're listening to The Glitter Boys. Welcome back, listeners, and welcome back, Kevin. Good to be back. (laughs) Yeah, we are continuing where we left off with this early days of Palladium, behind-the-scenes look at everything that... Uh, that led to this being a thing that exists today and is awesome. Like that That's the intro. <laughs> Everything that brought it here and is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Palladium Fantasy is the game that I cut my teeth with. It. I was, I remember, I must have been about 36 years ago when my older sibling stayed over one night, my half-sibling, and was like, you're Regdar the fighter. You're standing in front of a cave and you have a sword. What do you do? And I was like, what, 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 what is this? And that was my first exposure to the concept of role-playing games. And then flash forward five or six years, I think I'm 12, and a friend of mine sets down this specific book, the one that I am holding in my hands that I've had ever since. And it's like, all right, let's make a character. And I didn't even make a character out of this book. I played a centaur <laughs> <laughs> out of the second, out of the Monsters and Animals book. And that's, I had to hunt this cover down. <laughs> this is the, uh, the Kevin cover. Mm. Anyway, I'm getting off base here. Playing Fantasy started me on this journey of role playing games. And I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> well, you know, ironically, it kind of uh, started me down that journey too. You know, first D and D, and then uh, as uh, I was adapting and changing D and D for my my gaming group, you know, I accidentally invented, you know, this game system. As I had mentioned earlier, a few guys is that I realized that everything that's in my game system was pretty much a direct response to things that I found missing or unsatisfactory for me in my my game group in D&D and other games of of that time. Because a lot of it really focused on rules rather than Mm role-playing. And I love that idea of of role-playing. That was was just amazing uh, to me, you know, and... uh, you know, everything just kind of kind of grew out of that. Like, like the reason I decided to do one game system for every genre uh, from from the very beginning that that was my goal because someone would buy a new product and new game and bring it in and they'd be this is amazing, it's fantastic. Oh, but I got to learn another game system. Yeah, yeah. And you'd you'd see that over and over and over, and you know there were a lot of great games out at the time, and you know and so, for example, D and D and and RuneQuest and uh, um, Traveler and a bunch of other stuff that was out all had different games. I mean, when you guys mentioned that that even D and D, I think it was Jacob said, Boot Hill and all their other games, they had different rules. It wasn't D and D rules; it was variation rules. You know, you actually had to have conversion books for games within <clears throat> your own game line. It was just crazy. And I said, you know, let's get rid of that. And, of course, part of the problem is, you know, gaming was so new at the time that when I said I'm going to create a game system that works for every possible genre, every tech level, I was told by a gazillion people that you can't do it. And I'm like, of course you can. You know, I find it fascinating that people would tell you that that was impossible because you had already started it by – like I think your first incarnation of this system or what would become this system was the mechanoids, right? Yeah. I mean, so you were already doing laser guns and aliens and spaceships before even doing fantasy. So, wow. <laughs> well, 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 I mean, I developed fantasy first, but even in my fantasy game, we had all these different levels and, you know, level five was the tech level. So my guys, mm-hmm. like when you look at that picture of the defilers, you know, on, on that page in, in the RPG, 
you'll see guys in modern body armor and with what looks like laser or what are actually particle beam weapons. And, you know, it was just, but the mentality was at the time that you couldn't cross genres, that science fiction and fantasy could never work. In fact, at the Detroit Gaming Center, I ran a tournament that said, uh, you know, that that was the title of it was fantasy versus uh, technology or magic versus technology because people couldn't believe that you could have a game that could be balanced with magic and technology. And then mm-hmm. I'm like, well, fuck, it's just like what, what, what Isaac Asimov said. I mean, you know, tech at a, at a high enough level will appear to be magic. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, we're seeing that now with our freaking cell phones and stuff. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. And what you can do now. And, you know, to me, it was just balancing the numbers and, and doing it right. I mean, you know, what's the really other than, visually in your head what's the difference between a plasma bolt and a fireball or a you know call lightning and you know, it's just a different means of calling up that energy blast yeah <laughs> you know one you pull a trigger another one you cast a magic spell battery points versus uh ppe yeah. you know yeah. you can only <laughs> exactly. carry so many batteries <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right <laughs> so you know it was simply a matter of breaking that perception i think you know everything is really a matter of perception and degree mm. and i think at the time in those early days everything was was separate and i think that's also why you saw even within companies like tsr we were just talking about they had several different genres like D D and boot hill and their space game they're all different game systems back in the day because that was the perception of how you had to do it and, and, and we saw right away, or I saw anyways, right away, a, a pain point for players was, you know, someone would come in with a great new game, you know, oh, look at RuneQuest, it's awesome. Too bad it's another game system I have yeah. to learn. Oh, here's this. Oh, too bad it's another game system I have to play. So I sat back from, from the very beginning, even while I was playing Palladium Fantasy, and that's how I could come out with the Mechanoids, is I had already developed rules to accommodate tech you know already had you know eclipse and Mm -hmm. the whole nine yards um that was all in my fantasy game uh it was just a matter of taking that material and and building on it and and everything i did like i was saying earlier is i realized a lot of my game rules really grew out of what i saw as pain points for for players um you know how can you have a faster combat how can you be clearer of this or that um when we first played the D D uh psionic system it was mm-hmm. so bad that the two guys <laughs> and, and, and no slam on, on tsr but i mean it was just so bad that the two players it was so slow that the two players locked in psionic combat turned to me at some point and said kevin if you have to kill us our characters do it, do it, just kill us. And I'm like, wow, this is, you know, bad. And, and, you know, and of course I'm gaming with 26 players. So it's, they realized it was slogging down Mm -hmm. the whole game, uh, which was not anyone's intention. And, and so then I sat back and went, well, how can I make psionics fun? And I went in and, and, and did it. And again, part of that, my, my old comic book background, I mean, I had the X-Men as examples of, you know, all kinds of psychic abilities. Yeah. And plus I was kind of a fan of, you know, the supernatural and UFOs and all that kind of stuff. So I had read tons of that stuff anyways. And it was just a matter of bringing in, you know, certain concepts and certain powers and abilities um, and have it work within that. You know, one of my from a game design point of view is I, I wanted my psionics and my magic to be different. And which is why you don't see a lot of crossover with magic spells that can, you know, teleport or, or not teleport, but use telepathy or empathy or mind bolt kind of stuff, because you no know, one is psionic and one is yeah. magic. Cause if you, if there's too, too much cross pollinization, then what's the difference between playing a psychic or, or a mage. And I wanted there to be a distinct different. I wanted all the characters to have their own unique flavor and have their own unique set of abilities. I have a question for you about, uh, well, <laughs> we're going to dig down to the very, 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 very bottom of it. 
what is the story behind the name palladium so the name palladium that that <clears throat> i went with palladium books because my my big fantasy campaign with the 26 players was taking place in this golden tower in the middle of nowhere called the palladium of desire mm. and that was my three and a half year campaign of those 26 guys you know and I, I i loved it and it had you know personal meaning and so that's why i called it palladium books and the palladium role-playing game mm -hmm. I, I probably should have called it palladium fantasy from the beginning but i i didn't think of that at the time and so yeah that's why it, it, it's palladium so palladium then it was the palladium was like a mega dungeon yeah a mega dungeon for sure uh, and i didn't even realize this until years later when when one of my old defilers tom bartold who invested the ten thousand dollars so i could come out with the, the fantasy game tom was like kev you realize that all the core elements and riffs were in the palladium of desires and i'm like no that's not true at all tom he's like well how do you figure we had level four was the vampire kingdoms Level five was was a tech level with, with power armor and, you know, high technology. You know, we ran into Dr. Articulus, who melded the, the twin uh, sciences of magic and technology. You know, there were just all these different elements because we, we, we traveled all kinds of different dimensions. We were stuck in, in, in time loops and, you know, wormholes and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like... You know, there are gargoyles, and I'm like, oh, uh, hmm, hmm, I guess they're right. <laughs> I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and part of that, again, a lot of that grew out of people telling me you can't do it, which is always great for me because I always take that as like a personal challenge, especially if they're making a good point. If just being stupid or obtuse, you know, that's one thing. But if they say – hey, you can't do this because of blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, why can't you? Well, I'm going to. Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it really had nothing to do with, with the metal palladium. No, no, not at all. In fact, I, ironically, at the time, I wasn't even aware of the metal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you were riffing on the uh, old term palladium as um, a icon or relic of uh, protection and significance uh, from the Christian root word palladium rather than the chemical element palladium. So correct. Okay. Well, and and I guess in in Greek, a palladium was sort of like a big open market kind mm -hmm. of place where you could find just about anything. And that was sort of, you know, my concept of the Palladium of Desire is that you'd go in here and you had this super powerful wizard who could, who created the Palladium of Desire and who had traveled to all of these different uh, dimensions and, and associated with gods and demons and alien beings from across the megaverse, uh, a term I did not have yet um, that would come later. But, I, I love that that whole dynamic, and I love the whole anything can go because that's one of the things that fascinated me just about the concept of role playing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that that's why I incorporated all these elements. Is to me, the minute I heard about role playing, I'm like, wow, you you really are truly more than any other game, limited only by your imagination. So if you can imagine it, you should be able to play it. That was my philosophy, anyways, and always has been. And, you know, maybe you got to put in some some constraints and some limitations, but I wanted people to be able to play anything. And again, I think from my comic book roots and, and reading mm -hmm. science fiction, I love the idea that, you know, let's have different worlds and let's let's explore every possibility. I love stories. I want to play every kind of story. If I feel like playing film noir for a couple of weeks, I want to be able to play it. Yeah, if I want yeah. to play Cowboys and Aliens, I want to be able to play it. You know, in fact, I, I created my whole level four vampire kingdom because mm -hmm. the guys wanted to fight vampires and they just weren't <laughs> ready. And so I thought, okay. And, it, and and that taught me, you know, so everything is, for me, everything's a learning experience, which I, which I love. And, and, you know, I started out totally green playing this. So everything, 
that I would later incorporate into my games, into my method of playing. I just kind of learned by, by doing it and going through it. So one of my lessons to be flexible and to improvise was that I had spent probably a freaking month drawing and mapping it. Level four with the vampires was the biggest map in my dungeon, <laughs> like double the normal size. Mm -hmm. I had spent at least a month writing it. And I mean like 40 hours a week designing, rolling up the characters, identifying what's in every flipping room. This was going to be epic. And, and again, the Plane of Desire itself was a mix of magic and technology. So they're actually elevators. Mm -hmm. and that would take you to the different levels. So my guys, the filers, are at the freaking elevators, and they're about to hit the button for level four. And one of the guys, and again, I think it was Tom or his brother Ken Bartold, said, why are we always going down into the dungeon? What's around the plane of desire? And I'm like, okay, guys, yep, vampire, vampires, let's go, level four. <laughs> and, and someone else says... Yeah. Oh no. It's around here. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, just, the vampire's been waiting to tackle, boys. This is it. <laughs> like two or three other people go, yeah, we should explore around here. <laughs> and the next thing you know, the whole freaking group is like, yeah, let's, we can go to level four anytime. <laughs> Let, let's see what's around here. And that was the first time you did a TPK. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I got to ask, when are we going to see World Book Palladium of Desire? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people ha have asked. I, I have to admit that for me, that there's a couple of reasons. One, especially in, in my mind, and I think in the Defiler's minds, it, the adventures are so epic that, and, and personal. Like like someone asked me, so, someone tried to write, uh, a couple, several people have tried to write uh the land of the south winds and, mm. and i find myself time and time again saying but this isn't it you missed this you missed that mm -hmm. and they're like well what do you mean it's that? i mean I, I put in these i'm like no no it's just not it i've been there mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> you know because i have i've been there <laughs> in my mind i have been there we, we played for like three months in, in that environment maybe it was even six months and this isn't it. Mm -hmm. And of course, how could it be? They weren't part of that. Right. And, and then my other problem with turning into a game is, uh, or into uh, adventures is, you know, was pretty high powered because I had to design it for a group of 26 maniacs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I would have to dial a lot of that stuff down. Mm. And... I don't know how much that would water things down. Yeah. Probably not that much. I, I, I recently ran a couple smaller groups through the old Palladium because I, I found my old notes and my old maps. So I, at the last uh, Palladium open house, I ran uh, three or four groups of people through level one of uh, the Palladium of Desires. Mm -hmm. And it went pretty good. Uh, of course, it's just you know a two-hour, three-hour session versus a campaign but there was some pretty epic stuff in there and nice. sean keeps saying kev you got to do something with this you need to write it as a novel <laughs> you need to write it as a source book adventure source book you need to do something with this because it is full of, of great stuff i mean there's yeah. the demon here and the mad god and you know a bunch of great adventures you know the rock sasha which everyone hated he was really only known as the rock sasha he had a name lord something or other <laughs> <laughs> but everyone just directs Sasha, you know, with a, with a <laughs> scowl, you know, because they hated him so much. And so there are a lot of great adventures that I, I probably should try to memorialize in some way, shape, or form with the plane of desire. So you had mentioned a minute ago about pretty, pretty epic level, high, powerful stuff. Going back to the Palladium Fantasy role playing game, the original book, many books today uh, do the same thing that happened in this book which is they include an introductory adventure this book includes eric wujic's tombs of gersidi which you most games you look at that have an intro adventure you look at it you're like okay this is uh, this is a very simple thing we could probably do this in a session or two mm -hmm. tombs of gersidi will murder 
first level parties <laughs> quickly. <laughs> That 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 was ballsy. Like this is not it's metal as fuck, guys. I is, believe you we're said we're putting in the first book an adventure that is guaranteed to kill all of your characters. <laughs> like this is it, again, yeah, it, it was pretty metal. It was pretty hardcore. Now that leads me to a question, though: the expectations that were put into writing that adventure, into Eric's creation of that adventure, matched with your uh, foundation with this group running like twenty six players. When you published this game and when you put the rules down for other people to read and play, what was your assumption of the default party size that would be in your average tabletop game of Palladium Fantasy? I I always assume it's only four to six players. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I try to water stuff down because I mean, a typical group, it seems to me, is four to six players, sometimes a little smaller, sometimes a little bigger. But but. On average, it's four to six players, so that that's what I try to design it down to. And then, uh, you know, we never we tried to never talk down to our audience. Uh, you know, I kind of got that from from Marvel. My my big influence was was Stan Lee and how they did Marvel comics. You know, one of the things I loved about them, especially when I first discovered Marvel, was that it felt more adult. It felt more dramatic. It had more complex characters and stories. Mm-hmm. And I love stories and characters, and to me, that's what role playing is all about. Meanwhile, DC at that time, when Marvel was just really starting to blossom in the 1960s, you know, they're they're coming out. I mean, some of their stuff was more serious, but a lot of the stuff DC Comics was doing at the in the day was, you know, on par with the Batman TV show of the 60s yeah. with Powell. Zap and goofy and imaginary stories. I can't tell you as a kid how much I despised imaginary <laughs> stories. Mm-hmm. You know, you see Superman with an ant head, and it's like, how did this happen? And it's like at the end, it's like, yeah, eh, don't worry about it. It was an imaginary story. You know, it's always lazy. It's lazy writing. <laughs> story. You know, it's yeah. I hated that shit. Yeah. You know, in fact, when when it was funny because that was so prevalent in the day when Professor X died with issue i think number 42 and you have this kind of like silhouette of him just falling out of his wheelchair which to a big x-men fan like i was before x-men was hot i I loved the x-men and uh i see this cover and i'm like my mind is blown right you know i'm what am i 10 11 and i'm like holy moly and right on a cover it says not an imaginary story <laughs> nice. <laughs> so you know, we wanted to have stories of meat. Mm-hmm. You know, something else I just realized in between this podcast and the previous one, because I'm thinking back and talking with Sean and Alex, who is one of my defi- Alex is one of my defilers. You know about the the olden days and the game design elements, and Sean's always interested in game game design and what was going on in my head at the time. And, and I came to realize because someone. In fact, I think, uh, I don't remember it was in the last show when you guys mentioned how, I think it was, you guys mentioned how Palladium Fantasy was not D&D. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was a much, much more, you know, metal, grim, <laughs> gritty, dynamic mm-hmm. environment. And it, that, that really got me thinking about, well, why is that? Because it, it, it's true. And, and I think a lot of fantasy games that are built on D&D they follow more of a uh, of a uh, Tolkien esque mm-hmm. high fantasy kind of. Not that there isn't like grim and death and whatever in, in Lord of the Rings, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it, it's a whole different kind of approach. Where I think I was caught up more into sword and sorcery, mm-hmm. um, Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. In a gray meow mauser. Oh, yes, and my just, favorite. <laughs> I, I didn't think about it, but I, I'm reading. By the way, for people who are into comics or Conan or fantasy, the the new Conan comic by Titan Publishing. Yeah, they're are great. Freaking mm-hmm. great. Yes, they are mm-hmm. awesome. Just they feel like Robert E. Howard is writing them. Yeah, Jim Zub is uh, lurking on a lot of the online Conan forums mm-hmm. and just answers any questions that people have about them too. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's he's great, and, and they always have like a little write up 
about Conan and Robert E. Howard at the back of the comic, um, some little snippet about his approach and stuff, and something I, I never really thought about. And then as I'm reading this, I'm like, holy crap, that's in like all my games. Mm-hmm. And he, he brought up that not only was there sword and sorcery, but there were elements of horror mm-hmm. and the supernatural. Mm-hmm which must have invaded my subconscious as a kid because it's in all of my freaking yeah. games. My brain just started percolating over when you said Fafford and the Grey Mouser because I was like, Megaverse, Multiverse. Yeah, it's there. My God, there was a diving sphere in there. That's right. High tech, sword and sorcery, mm-hmm. elder gods, horrors from beyond the like almost Cthulhu level. And it's, yes. it's, it's, it's very funny that you said that. I was like... Oh, and then when you were talking about the uh, the Palladium of Desires, what was going on in my head was the World of Tears by Philippe Jose Farmer, uh-huh. where it's mm. where it's sword and sorcery and very very high tech and gods and monsters and aliens and yeah, yep. I was like, yeah. So D and D comes from Tolkien, and all the rest of the good writers go to Palladium. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, so let's D&D. not get carried away. Yeah. <laughs> Well, your gods, the old ones Mm -hmm. specifically, are burned into my brain as terrifying, horrifying, terrible things. I I have yet to see a game that goes further than that, because that is that I don't know. It's like the ultimate evil. It is that true manifestation of evil in all of its forms and these globular, disgusting, world consuming things that's hardcore. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's not a humanocentric God either. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it has, you can't appeal to it with, uh, you know, by selling it, your, your partner or your firstborn child or anything. It's like, no, I am here to eat everything that reproduces on a cellular <laughs> level. You know? Yeah. No. Uh, one of the things I loved about palladium fantasy when I first encountered it was, uh, growing up, I was a huge fan of, uh, shall we say low fantasy settings, uh, sword and sandal, uh, yeah. novels, Glenn cook, um, that sort of thing. And while you could hit high fantasy very easily with palladium, it had a sweet spot for that, uh, sword and sandal, mm-hmm. the black company, you know, NPC and I have talked a couple times about how the black company would fit perfectly into palladium and that sort of thing. And yeah, it metal AF. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I just, you know, when I was designing the, the environment and, and, and the, the characters, the, the player characters, I really wanted to put in, all the things that I loved and, you know, I loved sword and sorcery. I loved combining magic and technology and things people didn't expect. I, I, I loved, you know, um, um, Lovecraft and those elements and, uh, you know, they all made it into my book. Now, now I have to say on top of that, there's a ton of, of research. You would, you'd be amazed at how much research goes into a fricking fictional realization <laughs> but uh, i i think i read like 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 400 different books on on mythology mm. and magic and you know one of my my frustrating things as a dumb kid i'm 20 something when i'm writing you know the the plane and fantasy rules in the magic system is I, I buy all these books or go to the library and get all these books on on magic and you know i had kind of grown up on you know hollywood magic which is all you know satanic or, mm-hmm. or truly mystical and, and kind of druidic but you know it's your summoning creatures and monsters and creating zombies and like none of that crap existed in like when you look at what the real olden day magic it's like you know the closest you get to that is maybe a love charm and that's probably a potion that you drink um or, or that you give to someone so that they look at you and go oh npc jacob <laughs> so attractive but you know it's not you know fireballs yeah. and walls of flames and all that none of that's all like hollywood and comic book stuff mm-hmm. uh you know the real stuff is like oh hey matt you've got an upset stomach 
well, you know, take this poultice at midnight when the moon yeah. is half full, you know, and it's like, okay. <laughs> Way more Terry Pratchett level magics. It's yeah. very much. It was yeah. like answering things like, oh, how do I, how, how do we make sure, you know, our, our newborn child, our newborn calf mm-hmm. is going to come out healthy. Or where the hell is the water? <laughs> you know? yeah. Or, or where, where the hell is the water? How do you purify the water? Yeah. Oh, oh, you know, NPCs, you know, he's got a terrible headache. How can oh. we resolve that? Oh, it hurts. <laughs> Tray panning. <laughs> <laughs> You've got ghosts in you your know, blood. It, just, it was all these practical <laughs> things, and I'm used to, like, the Arabian Nights, and I want flying mm. carpets and, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of And there's very little of that in ancient, traditional. I mean, you get it here and there and you get it more when christianity really started to come into play because they had more of a good and evil you know devil kind of thing now i should say that that's really a lot of western stuff you start reading which i didn't get into until much later Uh, you start reading you know indian as in in india and and chinese mythology those guys are whacked out man Mm -hmm. they've Mm -hmm. they've had superhumans (laughs) and you know, six armed gods and all kinds of crazy stuff for thousands of years that, you know, the Western world is just starting to learn about in the last century. Yeah. But I, I wasn't familiar with that. So I brought in elements that I knew and loved, like, like, you know, Greek gods and Egyptian gods. And, you know, I knew a little bit about, you know, Mayan and Incan gods, because I've always found that fascinating, that whole culture. Uh, and so I tried to bring in all these different elements that I thought made great adventure. And then, you know, again, I drew from my experience of, of books and TV shows and movies. Like one of the, the the movies that my brain as a little kid went, whoa, was Jason and the Argonauts by mm-hmm. Ray Harryhausen. You know, when he fights the seven-headed Hydra and he chops off a head and two more appear. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and harpies, why are there harpies in my game? You can probably blame Jason and the Argonauts. Right. Uh, <laughs> You know, and 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 all these just elements that I, I as a kid I was just fascinated with, and so I'm like, how can I take all this awesome goodness from all these different genres, not just one? I hated, I don't know, I always felt constrained when it's like, here's traveler, here's you know this fantasy game or that fantasy game here, and it's like, but I want all these other elements, so you know that that's where. Sorry, I'm kind of ranted there <laughs> no well that, that ties into another question that i had from our previous conversation on the last episode when we were talking about valley of the pharaohs and how egyptian mythology is largely an untapped resource the the primary gods in the palladium fantasy known world are the egyptian gods and i've always found that just completely enthralling because you have these settings like like the Timuro Kingdom, for example, which is largely itself styled after medieval European-esque, maybe going into a renaissance. And yet they have these Egyptian gods. And it's a it's, it fascinating contrast that, that works. Thanks. <laughs> Where did that come from? Well, p- part of it is... Um, I, I, I love history. I'm a history buff. And if you look at all the old cultures, Babylonian and Sumerian, and, you know, they're, they're almost all of them. I mean, even if you look at, at, at Native American spirits and gods, there's a whole pantheon of them, whether they call it a pantheon or not. There's just a whole slew of them, and, which makes sense because, you know, uh, the older religions and mythologies are trying to answer age-old questions of life and death, fertility, you know, crop growing, seasons, the movement of the moon, you know, all that stuff. And they assign it to deities and give them cool powers and abilities. And as a kid, I was really into the Greek stuff because that was, you know, classic right and schools taught that stuff and then somewhere along the way i i I started to discover egyptian mythology and i'm like ooh, this is so much cooler and 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 different and then around that same time uh that i'm ranting and raving about 
the Egyptian gods at, at the Detroit Gaming Center, Matthew Balance, like, funny you should say that, Kev, because I've got an idea for, you know, Valley of the Pharaohs. And I'm like, ooh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let, let's do that. So I, I, I like steal cool concepts wherever I find them <laughs> and, and, and build on them. And then I also, and you see this especially in Rifts, but you see it in Plenty of Fantasy and some other games, I like to surprise people. Mm -hmm. I like to kind of set up my reader where they're kind of expecting one thing, and then I go, zing, how about this instead? Yeah, I like that. And it's just, it's just, it's just fun. <laughs> so it seems like to answer that, it's just, yeah. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Ju just to change it. Yeah. I like that. I mean, <laughs> I like taking expectations and flipping them. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, given how many gods the Egyptians stole from other cultures and how many gods the Romans stole from everybody, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it makes a lot of sense, you know. Um, so, one question I have is we're talking about, you know, the foundations of Palladium fantasy. And this had been a project that had been percolating in the back of your brain for a while. And it had been the one you wanted to come out of the gate with, but the money wasn't there and the logistics weren't there. You finally got everything lined up. You, you, had, you finally had a big enough business that could handle the load. You had this big loan come in. Were you sitting on a completed manuscript that was really close to going to the printer once everything got lined up or was there more work before we could see palladium the fantasy go into print it, it was 90 percent done nice so the game rules were, were 100 percent done well in my mind the game rules are never 100 percent done which is why you see little nuances and things added throughout the history of palladium uh, cause it's like, oh, I could have done this better or this works more smoothly or, oh man, I wish I had incorporated X, Y, or Z back then. But, uh, no, they, they were, the rules were 99% done. The writing of the book was at least 90% done. Uh, I went in and fine tuned stuff. Um, but yeah, it was mostly written in like 1980, 81. And then it was a matter of waiting until I could do it. And then getting the art done. Mm -hmm. uh, that was some of the last stuff that got done was me me doing the final artwork. And, and as we spent so much time last session um, just ranting about how wonderful the artwork is, it's yeah. like <laughs> that wasn't necessarily a small thing because you got some banger art for it. <laughs> yeah, there's a beautiful art style in this. And I love the meld of your pieces and uh kacharski's pieces yeah that long bowman is one mm -hmm. of my favorite oh, yeah. images in all of gaming it's simple it is it's not even a half page it's just a, a page header picture of this guy with a bow and that right there gives me so much more inspiration imagination fodder than any number of elves flying through the air, screaming and shooting out 18 shots at a time, you know? Yeah, right. we've, you, you probably <laughs> never heard us, but we go off on what we call, what is it, the constipated leap? Yeah. That <laughs> everyone's doing now. And we, we love that you don't have that. Yeah. I would like to ask about this fella right here. The little dragon? Because yeah. I, I've bought Hello. so many books uh, from you, and in a few of them, I will get. What looks suspiciously like a quick version of this fella. <laughs> How many yeah. of those do you think you've drawn in your lifetime? Seriously. <laughs> so it, it's interesting. I, when I first started out, I, I started, I, I, I was doing the dragon head drawing. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, I don't know, I felt kind of presumptuous d doing it. And I'm like, I don't know if people really want this. And so I kind of went away from it for a good decade. And and then I realized certain comic book artists like like Kevin Eastman, for example, like if you ask him to sign a book, especially if it's only like a couple of them, not three hundred, yeah, and he will sit there and he'll he'll sign his he does a little turtle head drawing, and a lot of comic book artists would do a quick little render, um, like Mike Kaluta would do a quick little render sometimes of the shadow and. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, Jack Kirby would do a quick Captain America or, or somebody else. And, and I always thought that was as a fan myself of that, of that medium, I always loved that. And so, uh, I would do it often on, and then I really dived in deep where I would do it a lot in, uh, I think it was 2004 or five when, um, Nokia had optioned, I had licensed riffs for their N-Gage video game and uh they they sent me on the pr tour and for the pr tour and in in european pr tour so we're in we're in italy and france and i i did a dragon head drawing and like the blank page of the hardcover or whatever Mm -hmm. yeah because it was mostly riffs ultimate editions i think and uh so that'd be 2005 and uh you would have thought that i was picasso or (laughs) You know, because they go, oh, my God, oh, this is wonderful. Thank you. And the next thing you know, because it's the first guy in the line of like yeah. a dozen people. And they're all like, can I get a dragon head? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, sure. For those of our listeners who may not be familiar with what we're talking about, may I invite you to go to palladiumbooks.com uh, uh, round about the holidays. And you're, you're probably going to get one. <laughs> yeah. yeah during grab bag season yeah, during yeah. grab bag season Especially if someone asks for for the, the drawing specifically they're going to get it mm-hmm. um if it, if i know it's someone who's a who's a regular i they're likely to get one in a book or two i try to when i unless i'm really swamped uh i always try to do a drawing in the palladium fantasy game on on the page with the defiler art yeah on hard covers, I try to to do a little sketch because again, you're paying extra. You know, I appreciate that, and so I try to give a little extra something. Yeah. Uh, and our fans are just so awesome, and, and and most people love it. So so yeah. So after that tour, where you know the Italians and the French and all went and the Spanish all went crazy over it, I'm like, I think I should do these more <laughs> often. People seem to really like them. <laughs> yeah, we still do. <laughs> So yeah, so so now I I don't know shucks I probably draw a thousand of those in a in a year. So mm-hmm. I don't know ten twenty thousand I've I've done in my lifetime so far. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I so you you have you have your manuscript. You're you're polishing up. You're you're getting those last pieces of art in, pasting in stuff from like uh, your your weapons tables and stuff like that. You're like you're almost there. So how do you how did you get from there to this out on the shelves and and what happened then like the 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 early earliest releases of w- walk us through that part well it's 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 kind of scary so so i i think i'd mentioned in in the first interview that whenever you finish a book and it actually gets released and you're holding in your hand, it's a lot like giving birth and you're holding your baby in your hand. And it just, it feels great. Even though you're, you're intimately familiar with what's in your hand. Mm -hmm. I mean, you wrote every word in my case, you know, especially on the early stuff, I probably drew half, if not all the the images and yet you're holding it. It's like, Oh, yeah, (laughs) you know, so for Palladium Fantasy, it was ultimately where I wanted to go. It's what I saw the future of gaming being with perfect dumb books and big books, not box games. And, you know, and then back then a box RPG was pretty much just, you know, a couple of pamphlets and, uh, you know, a set of dice, maybe a map. Yeah. And uh, I wanted, you know, I love books. That's why I named my company Palladium Books versus Palladium Games. And uh, not that I don't love games, but, and so this was finally the culmination of everything. And so it, it was scary. You know, I'd found, uh, I'd been searching for a printer who could who could do these things. So part of it, so your initial research is trying to find uh, a printer who can do it at a reasonable price. And I mm-hmm. was very fortunate in that Michigan uh, especially in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. It was starting to go downhill, in fact, by the 70s. We were the small publishing capital of the United States, if not the world. Uh, in its heyday, in like I think the 1950s or in 60s, there were like 200 plus print- printers, mm-hmm. uh, offset printers. I mean, it was huge. 
So I, I got quotes from a lot of people, interviewed two or three, actually more like five or six local printers, went to see their facility, and, and I landed on McNaughton and & Gunn. And, uh, you know, they worked with me to so I could learn the jargon and learn what I needed to do. And, you know, we, we sent it in. And I had a little bit of experience with magazines, so I, I knew how to do paste ups and that kind of yeah. stuff. And then, of course, getting distribution, that, that's always super tricky, too. Uh, and back then, there were, there were truckloads of distributors, but getting them to pick up your stuff is hard. So uh, I went to the American Bookseller Association in 1980 or 81. Um, it was like a trade convention and um, did me nothing other than I, I got to meet and befriend uh, Jordan Wiseman uh, there and met a few other industry people and then uh you know what i what i did with my smaller products building up to palladium fantasy is i would every time i had a new release i would ma I, so i got a list out of some magazine someplace uh and i think i actually picked up a flyer at the american bookseller association fair or whatever it was trade show that had a list of distributors mm -hmm. And I would mail a copy of my book to every one of those distributors on, on the list. And I'd have a little pitch letter and in our rate sheet. <laughs> you know, of course, the first few had like one or two books on them. But, um, you know, I think it looked better as we uh, had more and more product. And, uh, and ironically, I think the timing was great for Palladium Fantasy because what I didn't realize is I don't, I don't have a business background, formal business background is most companies go out of business in the first year and a half. Yeah. Uh, and when I say most, I mean like 90% of startup businesses go out of business in the first three years, usually in the first year, year and a half. So by the time Palladium Fantasy came out, I'd been in business two and a half years. So that carried some weight. Yeah. It's a nice meaty book. I mean, you guys are familiar with it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, it's got some wow factor to it. And, uh, and I just mailed it out to, to all these distributors. The more I came out with and, and the better the books looked, the more distributors I, I would pick up. I think I told you guys the Joe Budrick's uh, Windmill Hobby story mm -hmm. where Joe was this sweetheart of a man, but, but kind of cantankerous. Yeah, gruff. <laughs> and uh, he finally finally buys Palladium Fantasy. And I'm like, Joe, you'll be so happy with this. Our books are selling like crazy. And he's like, and, you know, your competitors are selling these like crazy. He's like, no kidding, kid. What do you think I'm buying this for? <laughs> <laughs> oh. On its own merits? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, but that's the cool thing, and I think I talked about this last time too, is, you know, Joe was awesome because he mm -hmm. gets the book, and he thought it was just fantastic. And he actually offered it to his stores to take – he he went to – because the, most of the, the – gaming industry and, and certainly the comic book industry especially back in the day is what's called direct sale distribution mm -hmm. which means if a distributor buys 20 copies or 200 copies or 2,000 copies it's sold to them on a non-returnable basis yeah. unlike the mass market and uh, so barnes and noble and other stores like that books a million they buy on a returnable basis which means they don't really pay attention to the numbers, what they're really going to sell. And if, you know, a thousand stores say, I'll try two copies, they order 2000 books. Mm -hmm. And if half of those books don't sell, you know, a month or three later, they're returning them and you have to pay them back the money they had paid you. And mm -hmm. it gets complicated and, and dangerous. Uh, more than one company has gone out of business because they, they underestimated returns. Yeah. So anyways, Getting distribution is, is a trick. Figuring out where to advertise, how to advertise, um, you know, and, and having the money to advertise, you know, that that's another step. Um, and that would come for us more a little later. I, I recall uh, seeing a whole bunch of advertisements in comic books mm -hmm. for Palladium. And Dragon Magazine. And Dragon yeah. Magazine, yeah. yeah. Well, we were, it's funny because, again, you know, uh, our industry, especially in the earlier days, tend to be a little myopic mm -hmm. and, and tended to be more of like follow the leader, where because of my background in comics and, and, and books, 
I would look at other industries and see what they do and how they do things. I mean, that's how I figured out the perfect bound. Mm-hmm. You know, part of it was I couldn't afford to do hardcovers. And when I told my printer that, they said, well, how about this new technology? Because it was new at the time. This new technology called perfect binding, where it's a square bound soft cover book. And I'm mm-hmm. like, well, what will that cost? And they're like, well, like a quarter of what a hardcover would cost. And I'm like, Ooh, yeah, let's explore this perfect bound stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with our ads, I again, I, I research everything. There, there's very few things that I do on, on a whim. Uh, everything I do is usually some calculated endeavor. Uh, and in the early days, you know, we started out as small as you can be. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have a lot of personal money. So I had to be really careful. I had to really research and make sure, is this a good move? Is this the smart thing to do? Because if we blow it, we just pissed away, you know, a thousand bucks or 2000 bucks or 5,000 bucks. Or in a case of a Marvel ad back then, only 12, you know, 12 or $15,000. And Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a lot. They made and, more money on ads than yeah. books. <laughs> well, we actually, at one point, like in 1991 or two or something, the IRS, because we were spending 20% of our income, of our gross sales went towards advertising. Mm-hmm. It's typically more like, like two to 8% uh, for most companies. And, and so they, they questioned our advertising and I had to produce receipts for everything. Mm-hmm. And, and the good news is they ended up owing me two grand. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yes. That's another month of Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, and, and, and my research showed that by doing ads and doing ads the way we did, like the other thing I heard a lot was, yeah, you do a lot of ads in, in, in dragon magazine, but they're all ugly. What? What? There's so much text. There was Veritex in that. <laughs> who said that? <laughs> what names? Lots of people. And, and you know, I, I again, I, I learn. I try to listen. I listen mm-hmm. to my fan base. I listen to uh, my customers. I look at what other companies are doing. And one of the things I realized early on, because you know, we were dumb and we did ads like a lot of people, where you have you know a really cool picture and a title and a blurb. That may, may or may not mean anything. <laughs> this is before the internet. So we would get called because we'd publish our, our phone number or people would track us down. Mm-hmm. We were in the yellow pages and we'd get hundreds of calls saying, hey, I saw your ad for Palladium Fantasy or Heroes Unlimited or Ninja Turtles. And uh, I want to know more. Like, how many characters are in it? Is it a complete game? Mm-hmm. Uh, how many pages is it? Uh, you know, who are the artists? You know, because in some cases, based on your fan base, like it was a big deal to have Kevin Eastman yeah. and Peter Laird doing new original art in in our game. So you wanted to say art by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, the creators of the Ninja Turtles. You know, having a, a cool piece of art at the top and then a headline and then some bullet points and then your text, a description of the book. It just cut down on those phone calls a lot. And mm-hmm. gave people the information you wanted to know. And again, sometimes in, 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 it's a matter of knowing your market. So like Coca-Cola, for example, everyone knows Coca-Cola. So when they do ads, they don't have to give you a ton of details. They just do something cutesy or, or sentimental or funny. Mm-hmm. You know, same thing with a lot of car ads and, and you know, Budweiser and, and tons of ads that have a lot of brand recognition, mm-hmm. those ads are to remind you, yep. man, I like Coca-Cola. Yep. Man, I feel like having a Coke. Is there one in the fridge? Mm-hmm. I need to run to the corner store and get me a bottle of Coke. But if you're a new product or if you're a product, like, you know, I found it crazy because so many people would say, no one wants to read all this shit in your ads. And I'm like, we're talking about a customer base that memorizes 350-page yeah. books. Yeah. <laughs> These are detail-oriented <laughs> people. They want to know yep. how many characters, how many guns, how many vehicles, how I'm, many monsters. I'm so glad you said that because the gradual like dumbing down of advertisements, I, I feel, has had an effect on us as a people. And I like that you just said, no, my people understand how to read. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, the, the, the other interesting part of that is 
how much you ended up being a trailblazer for the way games were advertised in so many ways. Like, the number of times I've seen a complete role-playing game system Mm -hmm. on the back of a book post-1990 yeah. has just continued to increase. Yeah. The, the the bullet points, even though that people don't directly copy them, but the bullet points that you laid out on in your ads and on the backs of many of your books with like blank new character classes, X number of races, et cetera, et cetera, kind of forced the entire industry to start going that way because people started to cotton on. Now it took them a long time to do it, that the consumer, the ardent fan, wants to know what they're getting. We expect it. Yes. Yeah. We yeah. And we don't well, want shrink wrap. And we don't it, want it, shrink wrap. <laughs> right. No shrink wrap, please. No, no. But yeah, so so it's it's funny because you know, people don't realize it now. And I appreciate you mentioning that that we were a trailblazer in so many ways. We were the first to do perfect bound books. Mm-hmm. Um, we were the first to kind of really focus on artwork and have great covers. I would actually have competitors come up at like Gen Con and Origins and go, who do you think you are, John Steinbrenner? You're paying a fortune for these covers. And I'm like, look, I don't tell you how to run your business. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Publish whatever you want. We're making money. I love art. I love artists. I love my fan base. I, I want to pay $3,000 to get a cover from Jim Steranko or uh, Keith Parkinson or Stephen Hickman, mm-hmm. Richard Corbin. I, I, you know, you don't have to do it, but they could see the results of you have a yeah. spectacular cover. Gee, maybe people are going to pick up that book more. And then you have to, and that's the thing is I don't think people really, a lot of publishers, especially in the early days, because a lot of these guys were were not much more business savvy than I was when I started up. But I researched and I knew what I like. And as an artist, I had an eye for that. And so for me, the first thing I wanted was, you know, for someone to, I wish we had kept this cover on Monsters Animals more with, with the Gromac on it. But, yeah. you know, it's, you have this dynamic cover and that's a, so the first thing they're going to see is that art. And they're going to go, what is that? I mean, Riffs is a great example. Of that. Mm-hmm. Palladium Fantasy, even the red and black cover, people loved that thing. It was so Dramatic. dynamic. Yeah. And so the art catches their eye. Mm-hmm. The title is going to intrigue them, hopefully. And then when they open the book, I want them to see some really cool piece of art yeah. that they're going to go, wow, what is that? And, you know, even now there's, there's, there's a certain, you know, books that will come out where you have a cool piece of art. It used to drive me crazy. And some of my competitors would have some amazing art in their book. You open it up, you go, what is that? And the answer, by the way, was a really cool picture that has nothing to do with the game. Right. <laughs> that, that, that would kill me. Our pictures would have something you're like, oh, that's a bear man. Oh, that's a wolf. And oh, that's some kind of kick-ass dragon or demon or monster or hero. And then I wanted the writing to be, you know, to match that. I always wanted, you know, in the early days of Palladium, I kept talking about wow factor, wow factor, push mm-hmm. the envelope, give us wow factor. I want wow factor in my art. I want wow factor in the concepts. I want wow factor in the writing. It all makes a difference. All those elements were, were part of a very conscious part of how we designed our books and what we did. So we were the first to introduce the Perfect Bound book. We were, us and and TSR, once they got over their hideous art phase, you know, they they got greats like Parkinson and Elmore and Easley, Mm -hmm. and the list goes on and on and on. Palladium and and TSR, for a solid decade, had the best covers on the planet. But yeah, you had to fork out some cash to to, to get that. And it also helped if you treated your artists well. Yeah, You know, we, we, we have artists to this day who... If we can't afford to pay their rates, I mean, a great example is Keith Parkinson was getting paid five, six grand to do a paperback cover, sometimes eight or 10 grand, you know? So when you look at that and say, hey, I'm paying Keith $3,000, that's quite a price drop. Mm -hmm. But again, as an artist, I, I knew this, 
if you treat them with respect, mm-hmm. you give them a certain amount of freedom, and you give them subjects they enjoy doing, a lot of these guys are willing to work for you at, at a cut rate because you're giving them something fun. These guys are creative people. They yeah. love doing these paintings and drawings and creating creatures. You give them the freedom to do that and pay them a fair wage and give them credit. They love you. Yeah. And that's how we got guys, you know, big name guys, uh, and then continue to get big name guys. I mean, for, for Pete's sake, uh, Stephen Cummings, who's, who did a bunch of the mechs in uh, Titan Robotics and has done a bunch of the art for uh, Creature Feature and some other stuff. I wish we could get him more often, but he's he's a big, big name Marvel comic guy. Yeah. And, and we're, we're, we pay him like half of what he normally gets paid to do our stuff, but he does it because he loves our books. He happens to be a fan. And we give him a lot of freedom and give him a lot of creative stuff where, you know, if he's illustrating a Star Wars comic, there's not a lot of freedom in that. Yeah. You know, the, the characters have to look like the, the actors and the costumes and blah, blah, blah. So we did that. I think the whole wow factor thing was a big deal. Having dynamic art, not just on your cover, but throughout was a big deal. Uh, I think in the next few years, starting with uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangeness reboot, people are going to see what, when we, when Palladium talks about color art is different than the rest of the industry. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're going to see spectacular color art. Yeah. So I got a question back, going back to that Monsters and Animals book that you held up a moment ago. That cover was the cover that I had been familiar with through for all of my life. Uh, then one day I was looking for a new copy of it to use in my tabletop games. I was searching on eBay. This is about five or six years ago. I found my, I, I did not know that so, there was a different <laughs> cover. <laughs> that, earlier, yeah. So yeah, what is the story behind the, the two different covers of this book? It, it, it's sort of a funny story. You know, and later, you know, later Keith Parkinson, I'd have Keith Parkinson do a cover. So there's been like three or f- three version, three different covers for that book uh, in, in its lifetime. And uh, so this first one, it, it's it's uh, <laughs> basically you have a, a fallen sphinx and this, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Gromac. And, uh, um, and, and, and I'm glad you like I like glad you like the cover NPC because it's hideous. <laughs> and, and the story behind it is, and this will be this will sound ridiculous. Uh, and I say it's hideous, and it's it's my art. <laughs> the whole book is done. I mean, done, pasted up, laid out, ready to go to the printer. I mean, it's like all right. We're taking the book in on on Monday. This is Friday night. And I realize, holy crap, we don't have a cover for this book. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) So I I, I painted this over the weekend. (laughs) And uh, it's not a Kevin Sabita masterpiece. (laughs) I mean, there's parts of it that aren't too bad, but it's it's not so good. In 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 that logo too, I think I forget if I did that or if one of my guys. Masters of the Universe. I was just thinking that it really looks like like a He-Man cartoon logo. <laughs> it, yeah, I know. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you know, and part of it was I, I did almost all the art, and certainly all the monster art for mm-hmm. monsters and animals. And uh, so I was just so obsessed with, uh, you know, getting the art done and, and writing up all these cool descriptions. I, I just forgot about the cover. Oh, no. <laughs> and so I, th- I threw it together and it it looks like it was done over a weekend. It, it's a combination of watercolor and gouache, uh, maybe a little acrylic in there. And it's it's not it's not a masterpiece. I have the original someplace still because it's just too ugly to sell. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, looking at our studio here, like, hey, we'd buy it. <laughs> you list that, let us know. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, this also opens up a side thought for me. I mean, if ever there was a game system that could do He-Man justice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Well, well, oh, continue. I, I just want to say something about that. And again, this is this is kind of the stuff that I don't think most people even think about when they, when they pick up a game. And, and sadly, sometimes it's not what a, a game designer thinks about is, again, whenever you get a licensed property, and we can do a separate episode if you want, mm-hmm. talking about licenses and the different design elements, or when we talk about Robotech or Turtles, mm-hmm. uh, it might be a good time to talk about it. But again, you need to think about why are you licensing this? Is it just for the name? Is it because you think you're going to make a lot of money? I, I've been saying for years, in my personal opinion, there's three only three reasons to license a, a, a more known IP. Mm -hmm. Uh, intellectual property because you personally love it and you're a big fan and you want to do it because it's close to your heart you're going to make a truckload of money and or it's going to open doors for you Mm -hmm. you know turtles and robotech hit all three of those for us but any one of those is a reason to do it but after you get that license and you see it for decades in films where they you know, why aren't anyone going to see this 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 Fantastic Four movie that isn't the Fantastic Four mm-hmm, or, yeah. or like the early Punisher movies or, you know, there's so many examples of bad TV shows and, and movies that were based on comic book characters or books that just sucked yeah. because <laughs> it's like this character that you love and know and the subtitle should really be and any similarity to that <laughs> it's here. entirely fictional uh, you know because they would just write their versions of stuff and without any consideration for the fans mm-hmm. or the original creators or the source material and you have to really think about that like we weren't surprised when tsr licensed indiana jones and the game tanked mm-hmm. there's a very simple reason to that one the world is too ordinary and too familiar yeah two who do you guys want to play I'm sure everyone listening to this, the three of you, you're all thinking Hindi. Sure sure <laughs> you know, it, it, well, I yeah. could be wrong. That. <laughs> but I mean, most people want to play Indy. Yeah. And then, yeah, who who's the next character? Yeah, short round. And then who? Right. You know, maybe some lady, maybe some new character. You have to create mm-hmm. new character. It's just, it doesn't necessarily, just because you love it. Yeah. In, in one genre, it doesn't mean it necessarily translates into another. And you have to think about that. At one point when Palladium was, was really hot after Turtles and Robotech, and, and we, were, we had a reputation for doing wonderful adaptations, we were offered all kinds of crap from all kinds of people. I shouldn't say crap because it wasn't crap. All kinds of wonderful stuff and stuff that I was a fan of, but I didn't think would translate well into this medium. Because uh, you also, as, as a business, you also have to think about, unfortunately, how many of these are going to sell? Is it worth your time? Because mm-hmm. whatever you're doing, it's going to take a certain amount of time and energy and cost with the art and everything else, mm-hmm. the printing. And then how are you going to sell enough to make it worthwhile? Yeah. And at one point, you, you, you know, I, I, like I said a million times, I'm a big comic book fan. And that includes newspaper comic strips. Yeah. And at one point, King Features comes to us and says, we want to license you our, our library. And a lot of listeners won't, won't know that some of these characters, but one was Prince Valiant, which is mm-hmm. famous for having mm-hmm. a magnificent art throughout its entire uh, existence to this day. Uh, but the original artist, Hal Foster, is, is like an art god that inspired guys like like joe kubert and john busama and neil adams and wally wood and a host of other people uh, jim Steranko. and i'm like and i'll have access to the art library i mean that alone was mm-hmm. like you know the sky mm-hmm. opened up and the angel sang and a sunlight you know beamed <laughs> down on me and i'm like this is amazing but when I really stopped the thing, there was things like Mad Drake, the magician and, mm-hmm. and, and the Phantom, which I also loved. I was a big Lee Falk fan, the, the creator writer of uh, the Phantom mm-hmm. loved the concept, but they were all just too ordinary and too limited. If you had a choice of playing D and D or Palladium fantasy versus 
you know, Prince Valiant. Yeah. There's just so much more you can do in those other settings. RuneQuest, all those games. It was just so much because Prince Valiant was much more mired in the, the real world and, you know, real knights and armor. And there's a little bit of magic, but not much. And, you know, same thing with the Phantom. It was a great character, a great idea in the 1950s but in 60s and even 70s. But after that, where do you go? And also, you have the same problem that you run into with Indiana Jones. Absolutely. It's a property based upon a single named character. Right. Yep. Like, even with the Ninja Turtles, what made it different was that it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangeness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. It right there in the title says this is a game yep. about or adjacent to the Ninja Turtles. Yep. But you Universe, pick up Indiana yeah. Jones and you're like, cool, I'm going to make Indy. And they're like, I'm going to make Indy. Okay, well, we got two Prince Valiants, two Indiana Joneses, and three Shadows. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's exactly right. That's why I, I it killed me. Yeah. And I, I, and, they, and I could have gotten this shit at the time. They were offering me these things that I loved for a song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it was like 15 grand for like, I don't know, 10 different properties. Wow. In, including those three that I said. Yeah. And, and I'm like, I, it makes no sense. It just, it, it's not a good business decision because it doesn't translate well. These characters and their worlds are too entrenched. I can't, I couldn't do what I did with Ninja Turtles. I now really, yeah. really want a palladium treatment of the Raymond and Moore period of Flash Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> the 1934 period. See, there's enough you could do with that. Uh-huh. Where, where it's an Flash ensemble Gordon, cast. And... Yep. I was actually just thinking of all the things that are adjacent to that would work. Like you couldn't do Indiana Jones, but you could do the mummy. The mummy has a lot of different characters moving as a party. Mm-hmm. Except there's no reason to license it. Right. Yeah. Because there's so many. I mean, we have mummies and all kinds of mummies and, yeah. mummies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and daddies. <laughs> <Good God. laughs> I'd like to ask you some more questions about your creatures. I'm yeah. fascinated with the kobolds. They are. Oh, yeah. yeah. The kobolds in Palladium Fantasy do basically what you've already said that you do, which is take expectations and mess with them. Mm-hmm. One who plays D and D will come to this game and see kobolds and think, "Oh, stupid little dog creatures." Yeah, first Cannon level. Fodder. But someone comes to Palladium and and as soon as they meet one of those kobolds, they're like, "No, these guys are badass." Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where did your kobolds come from? Mythology. Uh, it was, some of it came from mythology. Some of it came from, I felt bad for the little dog faced guys, <laughs> and I wanted to make them badasses. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See also Tucker's Kobolds. <laughs> you know, a lot of it goes back to whenever I design any character, uh, and, and, you know, I have my off characters where it's like, gosh, this one is so close to that. I wish I hadn't done that. But for the most part, I want to make every character, if it's in a book, I want it to be interesting and different. And that's a great example of that. Yeah. I mean, same thing with troglodytes, like like Sophie Campbell, mm-hmm. who writes um, the current TMNT comic book for IDW. She's, she's like obsessed with troglodytes. And, and she loves troglodytes. And most people would say, eh, I've read the troglodyte. It's okay. I'm not going to play that. But, mm-hmm. you know, again, I put in different characters and different races and species and you know occupational character classes because it's going to resonate with somebody yeah and if they want to play it there it is and your fairies you have a clear love of fairies as they they appear in many different places they appear in the core books they appear in adventures they are they're richly detailed all this stuff about fairy food and fairy magic and fairy pranks. But they're also not, again, they're not D&D fairies. Yeah. They're, they're very different. And in most cases, they're, they're kind of awful. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> what, Speaking to my I'm, Gaelic heart there, <laughs> it's like, ooh, you're wonderful and terrifying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but what's so fascinating to me is that so few other games really dive deep into fae. Like they might have 
a small adventure about mm-hmm. them or a supplement or you might see like some world of darkness spinoff game about them but when it comes to fantasy gaming the fairies are the ones that people just kind of dismiss they're like oh fairies mm. but in here it's <laughs> fairies <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh, you know <laughs> Go wrap your guts around the sacred oak. I mean. yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so there actually is sort of a story behind that. So, so number one, again, I'm, I've always been into mythology. I was big into fairy tales. I was big into Grimm's fairy tales and, and they're appropriately named Grimm fairy mm-hmm. tales because they're Grimm. And <laughs> I think people forget uh, a lot of this stuff because it's all been Disneyized. Uh, and everything's cute and happy and sweet and, you know, and when you read real fairy tales and real fairy mythology, they're usually or often very pretty kind of alluring creatures that are either very mischievous and chaotic or downright evil mm-hmm. yeah. and I, I i love that dynamic and you, you rarely see it so i drew a lot from from mythology and from uh fairy tales and like you know i mean if you go into the mythology you read all about fairy dancing and it, and it, it, it and it's not nice i mean fairies you pissed off a fairy and they make you dance and dance and dance and strip off your clothes and until you collapse mm-hmm. and that that's pretty insidious and I also love the idea of you got these little characters that are, you know, 12 inches a foot to, you know, maybe four, three, four feet tall. But most fairy folk are, are smaller. They're like three feet and smaller. And people just dismiss them. Mm-hmm. And, and I ran into that in my game when I first introduced a fairy. I had this, this <laughs> super tough, glowed in the dark dwarf. And this guy, he was a good player. He, uh, you know, they were wandering off on some adventure out, out in the wilderness. And he decided he had to go pee. This character had to go pee. And I'm like, okay. And I said, are you looking around? And he goes, no, nah, I just go behind a bush. And I, and I, I take a <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And you hear this voice going, hey, watch what you're doing. And this little God. fairy flies up, brushing <laughs> pee off of it. <laughs> The guy's a real jerk to the fairy. He's like, oh, you shouldn't be lurking around in bushes. I don't give a shit what you think. And the fairy's <laughs> That's like, unfortunate. really? <laughs> and I'm like, save versus fairy magic. And this is, of course, all new. If none of this was in D&D. But I had to work this all out. And, it, and he's like, he fails miserably. Oh, God. I mean, it's not even a... Because you need like a 15 or higher to save versus fairies most of the time, if I recall correctly. And, you know, he rolls like a three. And I'm like, oh, yeah. You're oh. just... <laughs> you know, charmed, and this fairy makes him strip off his clothes, and then it's like, "Are you going to apologize?" He's like, "No, you little bugger!" And it's like, "All right, fairy oh, dance." The guy yeah. again rolls like a five, no chance of saving, and he's dancing around naked, you know. And of course, it's making him do this, and like, you know, raspberry bramble. So he's getting all nicked up and <laughs> cut up, and. You know, and the rest of the group comes running over and is like, what's going on? Hey, stop that, you little creep. Boom, same thing happens. <laughs> half, half the freaking group, we're talking 26 guys. <laughs> like the original flash mob. <laughs> like, like, like 10 of them are all possessed and dancing. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and they're like, aha, I, I saved. You can't. And, and all of a sudden, three other fairies come up because, you know, they ignored the fa- the the circle of flowers mm-hmm. uh in the little mound and you know now all the fairies are coming out and they're like oh this group is just a blast and they're making people you know and, and they learned really quick not to mess with fairies yeah. <laughs> in fact the guy the first guy who really got you know punished by them because they also took some of his loot and certainly and you know his booze and oh. uh, any sweets that he had and and, and this guy you'd say is that a fairy over there? Be like, be nice to them. Be careful. <laughs> Treat them with respect. And I'm like, lesson learned. <laughs> Love it. And again, I just like that 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 juxtaposition, the, the, the dynamic of this little thing that looks like a butterfly can kick your butt mm-hmm. if you're not careful. Or maybe that one can't, but 
his 23 buddies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble, man. One of the things I think adventuring parties always forget is that thing has survived until this point. Somehow yes. you are not the first thing it's ever encountered. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, and it's funny you mentioned, uh, Matt, that you mentioned encounters. So one of the things that you see in my games, starting with Palladium Fantasy, and, and you see clearly with fairies that you brought up in PC, is you've got, there's an ecology mm -hmm. and a culture behind them. They're just not like Monster A, here's Monster B, let's throw initiative. in Monster H. It lives That's in this things, room. <laughs> it's one of the things that drove me crazy with D&D. And when I created a plenty of desire, so I mean, D and D, and again, it's it's a format that works. Mm -hmm. Nine thousand video games have followed it, where I walk up the door A, I pick the lock or kick it in, I fight and kill whatever in there, I loot whatever treasure there is, I go next door, repeat, and somehow the creatures, especially if they're intelligent, in that other room didn't hear all the fighting and screaming yeah. and shouting and bloodletting mm -hmm. in that other room, <laughs> didn't think about coming to investigate. Just from a story, a true story character point of view, it, it never made sense to me. So when I designed my game and my dungeons, I designed it so it made sense and that it had a real story, not just, you know, and again, it, it, it D, D grew out of a out of a war game, so it makes sense. You know, it, it's all about battle and getting points for kicking the bad guys. But, but this is a storytelling game. It's role playing. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. Let's tell a story. And, and what's even more incredible about role playing is we're all part of that story. If we're all playing this game. Each one of you guys are going to contribute to the story, but the actions of your characters, good or bad, or you know, silly or foolish, you know, clever or not, it's all going to. If, if you're playing with a good game master, he's going to build on. He's going to listen to what you're doing, and roll with what you're doing, and 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 it's magnificent. When you're done, you've got this epic story as if you just read a fantastic novel mm -hmm. or saw an amazing movie, mm -hmm. and you just walk out and you go, "That was amazing," and I was part of it. You know, that's why, you know, mm -hmm. gamers are notorious for, oh, no, he's telling me about his adventure. Because they're so <laughs> real, they're so vivid, and they were part of it. It's like, and then my character, <laughs> of the knight or, or, the, or the cyber knight or the <laughs> glitter boy, jumped in and did my ninja turtle. The most beautiful yeah. thing about role-playing games is that it can, it can bring you right into that story on such a deep and visceral level. And the saddest thing about role-playing games is it's so hard to express that moment to anyone around you because yes. you, you hear that, you hear that story a thousand times over. And then I, and the person's like, yeah, that's, that's great. That's, that's cool, great. man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but well, and we all do it. Yeah, we all I do it. Do it. <laughs> it's just like, oh, let me tell you this great story. And, and hopefully I'm telling you in an entertainment way. And you go like the fairy story I just mm -hmm. told, hopefully mm -hmm. people aren't listening going, well, that was boring. <laughs> You know, hopefully they got something out of it. Hopefully they found it funny. It's so good. Like I said, I've been to the land of the South Winds. Yeah. <laughs> so you published Palladium Fantasy. Was it as much of a success as you were hoping for, as fast as you were hoping for? What were those early days like? That's yeah. a really interesting question. Yeah. Um. So I think part of Palladium's success is that I had unrealistic expectations. <laughs> so I, I would later hear about how, you know, I would hear other publishers talking and it'd be like, well, you know, 3,000 copies is a, is, is a good selling game. And for me, that was an awful selling game. I was shooting, you know, my, my reference was book publishing, you know, like a best-selling book is selling hundreds of thousands of copies. Uh, maybe millions of copies and same thing with comic books a best-selling comic book in in the 70s and 80s was you know two to five hundred thousand copies uh, so you know selling three or five or six thousand i'm thinking yeah, i'm doing all right in my little niche market but it's you know far from big time 
So like in the first 10 years, Palladium Fantasy sold like 100,000 copies. It might have been in like the first seven years. That Those are great numbers, especially mm-hmm. back then. But I'm like, nah, only 100,000 copies? I guess it's a modest success. Yeah. Um, I was always shooting for 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 more and and i'm glad because i I was shooting for the stars if i if i was only shooting for three thousand copies i don't know where i would have gotten or maybe you know the stuff the content would still been good enough where it attract a lot of eyeballs but i i i I don't know you know and that was one of the reasons i went for for ninja turtles uh and that's gonna be a whole separate episode but i knew (laughs) it would open up doors and create a whole new audience for me that we didn't have Plus, I love the damn thing. So, yeah. I know there was a yeah. lot of, uh, I, I hesitate to use the words, but like D&D clones at the time, like uh, tunnels and trolls and things of that nature. I, I, I know why, in retrospect, why you stood out from, from those kinds of things with your own world, because they were clones. This is different. But what, what do you think to, to the person at the... At the Dalton at the time, I suppose, would be the, the bookstore, was seeing this line. Do you, do you think it was just as simple as, like, the, the cover or or where? Because where, I know you had the advantage. Where do you think it came from as as that, that row of non-D&D books was there? I, I, I think, and I don't know if I was fully conscious of this at the time, but I think everything we were doing was just so so different. Uh, and, and good because sometimes different is not necessarily better it's just <laughs> yeah. different or, or awful uh, <laughs> you know um not, not to slam the, the makers of chivalry and sorcery but but that's a great example of cool name it attracted me right away mm-hmm. and it's just they were so detail oriented again it, it's a matter of knowing your audience and, and deciding who you're shooting for so, I mean, they were shooting for an audience that wanted more realistic recreations. And so it was a great reference for if you wanted to, you know, what a tin cup might might cost in copper, mm-hmm. <laughs> in copper pieces. There it was. Or you wanted a list of every, you know, known possible item your, your adventurer might buy. It was there, but it was just so much and so much detail. And it was focused on the detail and the rules, not the role playing. And and that was, there's nothing wrong with that. That was sort of the way most game companies mm-hmm. of the day approach things. It was all rules with a little bit of color, you know, very little background. The whole concept was make a generic game system that was another thing we pioneered by saying no we're creating very specific unique worlds Mm -hmm. versus a generic world of fantasy or superheroes or whatever Mm -hmm. there was a very conscious decision on my part and and actually back then it was a risky decision because that wasn't the way games were being done and then i think really the quality of the writing the quality of the concepts the quality of the artwork that all put us in the limelight, I think. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and then, you know, like I said, visually people, human beings are visually oriented. So you give them good art that intrigues them, a cool title to a book or not so cool. I mean, the, what does the Palladium role-playing game say? Nothing. <laughs> good thought uh, though. <laughs> not one of my better titles. <laughs> it, it's like the old saying that, that the cream will rise to the top mm-hmm. and, and, and not that sound arrogant, but our stuff was, a cut or several cuts above the norm at that time, especially visually, mm-hmm. I think, especially concept wise, I think writing level, it was just all uh, above the norm. I mean, but, it, you know, it was an industry in its infancy. So we were all searching and experimenting and, and fooling around with, with, with different ideas, different approaches. That's why you had a million different game systems coming out. Yeah. Because people were, were looking for, you know, whatever. And, and, and you can still have a, a bunch of different game systems and worlds and things because, again, it's the uniqueness which works for and against you as a game designer or a game publisher is role playing is so personal. Yeah. You know, all of us are going to play our games a little differently. All of us are going to have our biases, our, our, the things that we really like, the things that we tend to rely on, the mm-hmm. things we draw upon from our, our own mental library of film and comics and novels and 
and, and so we're all going to play a little different. And that's why I never felt the slightest insult when people said, I love your worlds, but I play it with GURPS, or I play it with D&D, or I play it with whatever, because that's cool. That's okay. I'm glad you're playing in my world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And using my characters or my magic that that's awesome if that's, you personally prefer these rules or your house rules or whatever mm-hmm. the hell that's great well what's interesting is you can do that with with your stuff that you can't do with others i don't know how many hundreds of times we've said this on the show but instead of the the cost of the tin cup and its weight and how much you can carry in you know palladium or rifts or any of it you're telling me what the dwarves think about the elves, the kobolds, the trolls, the giant kind. You know, you're, you're giving me how likely the they are flavor. to be cannibals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how easy it is to go insane and what those insanities can be. You're giving you're giving the flavor of a world that gives so much immersion to the player as opposed to what the weight of that tin cup is. And I think myself and i'm just kind of working my way towards it right now that that is probably part of your success too is that it's not just for the palladium role-playing game you can take that and drop it wherever Mm -hmm. and you know you at the beginning of most of your books you you give uh use this how you will you know this is file off the serial numbers, move it across state lines and make it your own, you know? (laughs) And that, that permission is so rare, especially in an industry that's all about uh, slapping a new coat of paint on it and selling it right back to you, you know? So I love that we can take a game from 30 years ago and with just a couple minor adjustments, still play it in the most, what you're releasing next month. And they, they still mesh. And I, God, I love that. And that is so rare. As we're on fifth edition, sixth now, what's Coming going on? Coming in the sixth edition. Yeah, thank you for not selling it to that's, us six times. That's only the saying. numbered edition. That's the only the ah, numbered yeah. edition. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so you put out Palladium Fantasy. Did you have any of the supporting books already set up and ready to go or at least in the pipeline or were you throwing this sucker out into the wild without any thought on follow-on product i i had some ideas for the uh, uh old ones because it was a campaign that i had play tested specifically for for releases but it wasn't real it wasn't written at all mm-hmm. it was just something that i had been running for a year uh, and I had some ideas on what I wanted to do because uh, Judges Guild came out with, uh, oh, what was it? City State of the Mad. The city, over, yeah, yeah, the City State of the Overlord. Or so, and, 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 and it was just hugely popular. So I thought if I do a book that has cool stuff, cool adventures, and like all kinds mm-hmm. of cities and towns and See, that's a good Kevin Sabita cover. I'm pointing to the <laughs> oh, old ones. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you look at you put that is one of my favorite covers of the entire Thanks. Palladium catalog, simply because it is terrifying. Yes, yes. Thanks. So no, I I really didn't. Uh, I so I think one of the mistakes some publishers do or some creators do is, is they have this whole magnum opus planned out what they want to do. You know, I've seen time and time again where someone comes out of a game and it doesn't doesn't fly, doesn't take off. And instead of saying, well, it was a good try. What did I learn from this? How can I make my next endeavor better? They say, you know what it needs? Support. Mm-hmm. No one wants it. Let's give it six supplements. Yeah. And blow our entire budget and go out of business in a year. Mm-hmm. I never had that approach. I, I I always sat back and said, you know, gosh, I, I love this or I wouldn't be making it. I wouldn't be publishing it, but maybe others won't, you know, like Valley of the Pharaohs is a good example of that. Mm-hmm. So when I come out with something and it doesn't sell really well, I move on. I, like I said, I take the lessons I can learn fr- from that. Why didn't this sell well? And then I move on to some new idea as opposed to beating a dead horse. So no, I didn't really have, I was hoping it was going to take off. You know, I had, you know, three and a half years of, of adventuring with the defilers under my weight. I had another year or two of gaming with some other folks. 
And I thought, you know, I, everything gives me ideas. So I'm like, yeah, I've got ideas for all kinds of stuff. What would be fun? Oh, I bet High Seas. Let's adventure on the High Seas. One of my favorite books. Oh. <laughs> you know, when, when Arms of Nargash Tor, which was the first little comic book size supplement, came mm-hmm. out. Um, you know, that was, yeah, yeah, you got it. I've got mine here someplace too. Um, you know, that was a Randy McCall, Randy McCall, one of my, my gaming buddies said, Hey, Kev, I, I really love Palladium Fantasy. Uh, I got an idea for a little source book. Can, can I write it up? And I said, yeah, go, go for it. Give it a shot. And we published it and it wasn't a huge hit, but I mean, it did it all right. Uh, it's fun. I think it's good. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I came out with old ones and, of course, monsters and animals. And, you know, a lot of it is because, and again, I I personally think it's an advantage of being a fan of all this stuff. So I kind of sit back and go, what would be fun and what do I think other people would want to play? Yeah. And I kind of write, like I I sat, sat back and went, you know, monsters, monster manuals are cool. So let's do monsters and animals. Bringing it back to Old Ones, Old Ones stands the test of time to me as one of the best RPG books I've ever owned, read, or that has ever just existed. We've talked about it multiple times on this podcast about how good that book is. Every page is exploding with fodder. Imagine little hooks, little ideas, Mm -hmm. little things. Like you're looking through the, the... just the history, the lineages, and you're wondering why did that? Why was that uh, reign of that king so short? Or you're looking at the the numbered key descriptions of a map, and you're like, why does this guy hate his neighbor? And you're like, every little thing in there is just is a hook. Yeah, it's just mm-hmm. a hook. That is it my actually the first time I ever played an RPG was Palladium, and it was the old one's adventure, uh, the Hidden Temple of. Uh, I, I forget the guy, but the hidden temple. Mm-hmm. And I remember just, we died in the first room. There were some goblins that killed us as we fell into a pit. You know, it was, it was hilarious. It was wonderful. It was great. It's like, this is like you flipping off your friend yeah. <laughs> and, or you flipping <laughs> off the, the, the enemies and them killing yeah. you. Yeah. I was like, Oh my God, I went to a room and died. This is the best thing I've ever experienced in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but old ones, those little hooks, those little characters, like, just the random NPC, the the blacksmith of the town, or mm-hmm. the the Cooper in this other town. How many of those were inspired from characters that you actually had in your games? Um, most of them. Nice. Um, and again, for me, it's all about character and story. Yeah. So I'm trying to consciously give you those hooks, so as a game master, you can run with them. You know, again, it goes back to some of the early source books that I was frustrated with because it's like, here's Bob the blacksmith, and and he makes stuff, and here's what you can buy from him, mm-hmm. and and here's you know the lonely sailor tavern, and uh, it sells this booze and that booze, and you can get a dinner for five gold, and I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. but what? can i do to make it more interesting why do i want to go to the lonely sailor and maybe hang out or oh because it's rumor has it it's really uh, you know tied into the thieves guild or it's suspected that the owner's wife is really a witch and there's been some things happening lately and some people wonder if she's responsible and right away there's just and it's like three sentences maybe even one sentence yeah. but if the game master wants to run with that, it's it's there. And so I I try to design them as game master tools mm-hmm. that that they could have a lot of different side adventures. You know, I want to all my books. I try to give you just a wealth of ideas and information that you, the consumer, you the 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 game master can have fun with and if Mm -hmm. you do that's great if you don't that's okay too i mean one of the things i you know you get kind of as you do this especially over decades you don't really think about your 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 formula because some of it just kind of happened you know through osmosis anyways or through evolution 
or what your deliberate intent, uh, intent was is kind of forgotten. And, you know, one of the things that when Sean, he was, he was pretty funny when he first came on board, uh, we'd have all these talks. I mean, like every freaking day where it's like, so I want to understand the secret sauce. <laughs> what were you thinking when you did this? You know, what did you do when you did that? Why did you do this? Do you, are you aware that no one else does things like this? And I'm like, uh, you know, I hate to say it half the time. I'm like, no, I, I wasn't aware of that. It's just how I do it. <laughs> yeah. And it's just what makes makes sense. In fact, we're talking about starting a regular weekly campaign that I'll be running. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask, do you, do you still play? Do you have I, time? Mostly at like, like conventions and yeah. special events and one-shot stuff. Like when Sean's daughter came in, she she's fallen in love with Palladium Fantasy. She's 13. Yes. And uh, so she loves age. Palladium Fantasy. Mm-hmm. It is. It's a great Raising age. Raising that child, and, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they do it. Well, she reads voraciously. She reads all kinds of really cool mm-hmm. uh, books and series and things of novels, and uh, so uh, she she fell in love with Palladium Fantasy. So when she comes in town, because Sean's divorced, and they they share time with, with the daughter. So when she comes to town, she's like, "Can we play Palladium Fantasy?" She loves all kinds <laughs> of board games too. So we've, mm-hmm. we've played. Uh, uh, all kinds of different things. And uh, so, so you know, I'll run some stuff for, for her. Like mm-hmm. I ran her, ran her through Lord of Silka, and then I ran her through uh, a little bit of the Plenty of Desires and, uh, you know, turned PG-13 versus versus our hard hour. <laughs> uh, uh, in fact, at the gaming center, I think one of the reasons I got 26 guys was because I had a reputation for, A, being a killer game master, which I wasn't. And B, I ran an X-rated dungeon, which <laughs> it really wasn't. But I mean, you know, again, we're, we're all twenty-something guys. Mm-hmm. There's a brothel. Yeah, right. Let's. I mean, we didn't play through sex acts. That's gross. <laughs> but you know, I, I mean, when I, you said I, lonely I, sailor, that's what I was thinking. I mean, that's what's going on with the lonely sailor. <laughs> See also Matthew getting off the boat from the yeah. Bering Sea. <laughs> I I had a reputation somehow in my early twenties as being a killer GM, and I don't know where it came from because I would actually do everything I usually could to try and keep players alive. But I suspect it's tied into another rumor that went around our group that they, whenever somebody new would join my group and they would make a character, I would always hear a player say to them, "You need to take swimming." Trust me. <laughs> It's in PC game. You need to take swimming. <laughs> and I think both of these rumors came from the fact that I once had someone drown wearing full plate armor that they refused to take off while trying to swim across a turbulent river. You monster. How could you? And they failed their <laughs> swimming tests. I gave them three chances. Three chances. That was, I was yeah. very generous. And they drowned. And suddenly, I'm the killer drowning GM. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. And that's I, I played the same way. I mean, I play... When I run as a game master, there are consequences to your actions. And you do something stupid, like deliberately piss on a fairy, because as I think about it, I told that story a little wrong. He that the fairy showed himself first. I go, What are you doing? And he goes, I'm gonna I'm gonna pee on it. Oh, oh yeah, so he had it coming. <laughs> and yeah, so he got his comeuppance, right? Yeah. You know, that same guy, like a couple uh playing sessions later uh similar thing where he he dives into the ocean to get something or may might even been to rescue somebody which is noble but i mean you're in freaking plate armor yeah <laughs> what you're wearing and he didn't want it it was magical so he didn't want to give it up yeah. you know, he had gotten in some other games i would let these guys bring whatever stuff they wanted to bring in because i would deal with it one way or another mm-hmm. and i'm like you need to lose the armor or you die and it man, it killed him mm-hmm. emotionally to lose the armor. He was smart enough, at least, to I cut the straps. Oh, thank you. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, he was, you know, heroic but stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and 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 by the way, that's how I find out most. If you're a good game master, I think most any character player character that dies either dies out of stupidity. Or heroism. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, if, if you're willing to be that guy who I'll hold them off, you guys run, and you knew you might die. I mean, that's great. At least then you get a good grave. 
And a good story. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of here lies Thundor who refused to take off his like steel boots. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And 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 playing dumb is is fine. You know, Mm -hmm. it adds I I try to play when when a player character does something silly or foolish, I, I, I often try to make it humorous. Yeah. So he doesn't feel like he's a complete jerk and people don't make fun of him. But you know it happens, and if you're dumb and you die, you know, like you, I always try to give them options. I try to mm-hmm. give them clear hints, mm-hmm. but like, don't go in there. Are you sure you want to go in there? You hear these horrible screeching, like someone being tortured. Are you sure you want to go in there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you sure you don't want to get the rest of the group before you do that? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you sure you want to drink that unlabeled potion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah allow me to ask you a third time if you're sure yeah, certain. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys mentioned you love the alignments and not, mm-hmm. i mean if you got but mm-hmm. i'm just curious so what's your you said you've had entire entire show like i said i tried to watch it mm-hmm. but i just don't have the time i, I got into like five minutes of it mm-hmm. and then i had all kinds of other stuff and and i was really dying to listen to it because you, you you gave it a lot of hype but Mm-hmm. So what's the story of alignments? We had a really good chat about it. I think all of us are on board with the Palladium alignments yeah. being the best. I think the point of most recurring discussion is the origin of the aberrant yeah. alignment. That, that's that's where I think we're, we're having a, a lot of back and forth. Yeah. Where did that come from? So it's, it's real cliche to have your diabolic character mm-hmm. who's just <laughs> I am ultimate evil and I, I like to hurt people and kill people and stab people and torture people or I want to take over the world and I'm utterly ruthless so I don't care who dies I kick dogs and puppies and yeah. cats and you know I eat babies That that's easy and, and, and the same thing with miscreant everyone gets the selfish evil character You know, I'm going to steal from you, rob from you. If I got to kill you, fine, Mm -hmm. because I don't care. I'm out for me. He's Mm -hmm. the henchman with a mullet at a 1990s action television show. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) But there are a lot of, I think, throughout history in in the real world and in, in some good books and movies and things, there are these villains that, they may even think of themselves as the hero or the good guy. Those are my favorites. And they have their code of honor or, or ethics. It may be twisted. You know, that guy may may eat babies for, you know, <laughs> horrible ceremonies that give him power. But, you know, in his mind, he's only eating, you know, babies that are maybe, you know, sick or not human or not his species. And, um or that he perceives as evil or you know whatever you know there are villains that have a sense of honor and i think some of that drew mm-hmm. out of uh, enemy ace uh, a dc comic book drawn by joe kubert that's magnificent where you know enemy ace is exactly what it sounds like it's a world war one uh, fighter pilot and but they had still that sense of chivalry and a code mm-hmm. of honor so if you were uh, a really great combatant and he could have gunned you down he doesn't he said he salutes you and we'll fight another day because yeah. you showed him incredible skill or valor and i respect that you know you've got you know villains who if they give their word of honor they are really going to live up to it. They're not going to break that promise. And that's what I, that grew from. I want characters that are interesting and different and nuanced. And, and that's that villain. I, I love them as NPCs in particular. And in fact, the Defilers were like shocked. When an NPC they had from almost day one, mm-hmm. which was a, 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 well, actually he started out as a, as a knoll because we were playing D&D. Uh, and I kind of transformed him into a wolfen. But uh, transitioning him into a wolfen, but this guy was aberrant evil always. Mm-hmm. But the group always fought things that were either his enemies too, or which he saw as as you know honorless. So 
yeah, let's kill these guys. I, I have no qualms. You know, there are numerous times in, in the group kind of, or certain members of the group kind of let them do it, where it's like, I'll get that guy to talk. Yeah. And, and you know, in, mm-hmm. in half the group would be like, well, wait a minute, what do you mean? <laughs> in the other half Don't worry would be about like, it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to walk over here and why don't you have a conversation with that guy? Mm-hmm. But it, it always, he always fell into their for the most part their their moral code and because they were his friends and they were part of his team and he was a team player they never had a conflict he was always there he he saved some of their lives a couple of times uh you know he you know take a bullet mm-hmm. sometimes literally you know leaping in front of someone or would save a child because he didn't believe in hurting kids and stuff and he had his code and finally, these guys are, are are going into literally going into the pits of hell to to, to fight the Lord of Hell, and 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 and, and this is big thing, and and everyone's all hyped up to do this. And this character says, "I can't go with you." And they're like, "What do you mean?" He goes, "So that Lord of Hell is my is my deity." <laughs> he's what? And Wait, if what? <laughs> if he calls upon me to fight you. I will, I'm sorry, my brothers, but I will fight you to the death. And they're like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, but, but, but. And he had been a loyal defiler the whole time. Yeah. But there was a certain line that, that he couldn't cross. And, uh, you know, I, I love that. I love that kind of thing. I also, with the alignments, I love it when someone says, I'm going to kill this guy. And I'm like, mm. time out. As a game master, time out. <laughs> you can do that. And in the, in, I just want you to understand the characters and, you know, the, the heat of passion here. He's so angry. He's so vengeful. He's, you can kill him. I just want to point out that it's against your alignment. Mm-hmm. And if you do this, you're going to drop from, you know, scrupulous good to anarchist. That's your choice. Go. And it's cool because, again, I love seeing the player wrestle with, gosh darn it, my conscience just spoke up as the game <laughs> master. Right. And, and am I so hate-filled or angry or hurt that I want to kill this person or torture them or do something heinous? Or am I going to go, oh, I want to kill you so bad, but <laughs> I'm going to do the right thing. I love yeah. that. That's, that's storytelling. To answer your question as to to why I, I, I feel that, at least personally, because I'm the one who normally brings this up, is like, it's the best ever. I don't know if you're familiar with this particular villain, but there's an old show, Eon Flux, uh, who has yeah. a villain, Trevor Goodchild. Yeah. Trevor Goodchild cannot be encapsulated in D&D. You, you, there is no Trevor Goodchild alignment. There is in Palladium Fantasy. He is aberrant. Or Palladium, you know, just... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, he's aberrant. He is a, a a leader who will cut people open for their own good. You know, he, th- there's a little Mengele in there. There's like, there's some really bad parts of him, but he is also this like shining leader person uh, yeah. of, of, of his whole nation. And one of the reasons that I prefer the Palladium system is that there is room for the nuance. It's not a straight jacket. It's a guide. And you can you can put any kind of personality into those because they're they're open enough. Not and and also there's no chaotic neutral because chaotic neutral is just a destroyer of of worlds it, and parties. Yeah, you, and, you discuss that philosophically for hours. Yeah. And, and you know my personal stand is it does not exist except as a convenient way for you to say my character can do whatever he feels right. like doing. Yeah. Because nobody is truly neutral. We all have our biases. We all mm-hmm. have our our morality, we all have that line we will or will not cross. No matter how neutral or objective anyone tries to be, there's always that bias there. There's a certain, and, and really alignments is your moral code. Yeah. So you're going to have those tendencies. Just like, you know, for me, the unprincipled character is, when I created it, the, the character, the fictional character i kept thinking about was han solo yeah where he was he started out probably an archist but by the end of a new hope he was unprincipled because damn i want to do this but 
I need to do the right thing. Yeah. I, again, I love that character who, no, oh, depending on the circumstances, you know, I'm going to do, I'm probably going to do the right thing. Of course, the right thing might not be, oh, hey, Matt or Jacob, your character dropped his his gold coins or his uh universal credits and uh maybe i'm just gonna scoop those up because you know what you annoyed me earlier in the game and you know the hell with you I'm, <laughs> and now i got your fifty thousand credits ha 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 you'll never know but that same guy is going to save the kid or save mm -hmm. the empire you know he's a rogue and he's got dark leanings but when push comes to shove he's a good guy yeah. Even if he hates himself for it. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I, I love that. So we didn't get a chance to do it because we talked about it off the mic, but you were saying something about the, the cover of the Northern Wilderness book. There was a piece of art on that. Yeah. Yeah. So Adventures in the Northern Wilderness is a beautiful cover by Keith Parkinson. Mm -hmm. And it depicts this uh, wolfen necromancer with a crystal skull in one hand. You've got these these uh, dead human uh, warriors rising up out of a frozen swamp or, or lake. And it's this very dramatic, moody, magnificent piece. Uh, other people might know it as Arcane Summons. Mm -hmm. That's how he built it when he uh, was selling it as a print. It's, it's one of his more famous pieces. It's, it's gorgeous. It's dramatic. And on the tassels that he has... It uh, there are there are actually palladium runes on it, and the, the the funny thing about it is that you got this very dramatic piece, and the ruins say, "Boy, what a tough job I've got." <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I I love the little hidden runes in the Rifts book too. Mm -hmm. Let's see, there in was the one Walker. that was like there was Evil Eye. Another one said, "Walk with me," but my favorite one says lobotomize me <laughs> oh yeah, yeah i think those are all kevin long yeah, uh, yeah. So they lobotomize me is and 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 i think walk with me um because he was there when we got the painting from from parkinson that's so cool and uh you know it was one of those because back in the day you know you didn't have scanners in your house you know this so we actually get the physical painting which was awesome and uh we're looking at that and i'm like Hey, are those my runes? <laughs> and Kev's like, yeah, I think I think they are. I'm like, I wonder if they say something. <laughs> so I grab my book because I didn't know my own ruins well enough to to just read it mm -hmm. offhand. And so I read it, and, and, and we just both got a kick out of it. That's it's amazing. Like little, that little Easter egg hidden yeah. in there. Oh, well, thank you for walking us through the uh, the Palladium role playing game. It's it's early days and. Where we're going next time is Wait, Heroes where? Robotech TMNT. That that yeah. little era, yeah, 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 yeah. little era, <laughs> little, era. <laughs> little era. <laughs> yeah, so you, yeah. you've you've taken off and and you're running, and next we're starting to get uh, some of the big names coming in. So that'll be fun. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's it's always a blast to have you here. Yeah. Oh, my, my pleasure. You guys ask fun questions. Sorry if I ramble a little bit. Not no, at all. No, that, not that's at what all. we're here for is, yeah. is we yeah. want to hear these things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure a lot of other people want to hear them as well. And we, the feedback yeah. we're getting from the discord community is they do love the in-depth storytelling and the, the thought processes and stuff. So. Yeah. So please don't keep it on point. Just <laughs> you, you go where you go and we'll, we'll, we'll steer. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> also, thanks so much for linking us in your uh, your email newsletters. Oh, yeah. We've gotten so many new listeners and new comments from folks, and they've all been wonderful. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Happy to do it. Yeah. All the all the Palladium community, like they're all here. They're all here because they love it, you know. Yeah. And it's it's just great to see those pieces interconnect and kind of move in the same direction together. Yeah. Well. Any final thoughts? Yeah, it was so much fun. We should do it again. Maybe like uh, next week or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, dear listener, if you want to hear more, just stay tuned because we've got more of these sessions coming. Uh, we've got so much more to talk about. Yeah. So, so much yeah. more. Yeah. It's all wonderful. Thanks again, Kevin. And folks, thanks for listening. 
Uh, Kevin, do you have any ongoing sales or things you want to pitch right now? Um, I, I don't think so. I think the only thing we have on sale right now is uh, the Cyberworks deck for $10. It's normally 15 Okay. And uh, it's pretty cool. And other than that, no, we've just been uh, really focused on uh, doing some business stuff and, and getting the uh, backer kit up for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle and other strangeness uh, pledge management. Um, and uh, I guess the only other thing I can mention, which will date this a little bit, but the, oh my God, the art and, and the digital coloring and the miniatures, they're, they're astonishing. I mean, when people, I know people are excited and they're going to want to get this stuff, but when they see it, holy moly, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I mean, I'm wowed. I mean, I knew we hired good people, but mm-hmm. some of these guys are just, just brilliant. And that's what I mean. You're going to get a hint from these books of like what will be coming in the future from Palladium when, when we start doing more and more color books and, bigger projects so that's awesome wonderful well you heard it here first folks hopefully maybe you did we heard it here first <laughs> we heard that's it what we're gonna go <laughs> so, anyway thanks for listening folks we'll we'll catch you next time all right thank you Starships, magic, mystic martial arts, romance. All of these can be found in A Cloak of Blades by Isaac Sher. You might have heard my name before. I've done a lot of voiceover work for Breakfast Puppies. And I've recently released my first novel. It's available on Amazon as an ebook and paperback. And you can get it for free if you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription. I do hope you'll support my work as you're supporting Breakfast Puppies. And it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Have a good one. You've been listening to The Glitter Boys, a Palladium Books fan podcast. Glitter Boys, Rifts, The Megaverse, and all other such topics are the property of Kevin Sambita and Palladium Books. Please buy all their stuff and help keep them in print and making more games. You can order directly at palladiumbooks.com, and their entire catalog is available digitally at DriveThruRPG as well. Our opening music is 8-Bit Bass and Lead by Furby Guy from freesound.org. This closing music is Caravana by Philip Gross, available at freemusicarchive.org. All sound effects used are self-made or acquired via Creative Commons Zero License. If you like what you have heard, find us on Twitter and Facebook as The Glitter Boys. That's B-O-I-S. And check us out online at breakfastpuppies.com slash glitterboys. And also join us on the Breakfast Puppies Network Discord at breakfastpuppies.com slash discord. And if you want to help us out, please spread the word and help us build a community. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time. 